everyone. Uh, please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Steinberg, can you take a roll call, please? Here. 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 Okay. Um. Next on our uh, agenda is um, the performing arts update. Yeah, so the board requested that we get an update on where we are with the performing arts. So um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Leslie Silbernagel and Dustin Gearing, who have invited some of our music teachers throughout the district to give an update on our performing arts programs. So I don't, Dustin, Leslie, which one's going to start? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Just want to test the audio. Sounds like I got a little feedback there. Am I okay? You're good. Okay, very good. Well, we are excited to present to you some updates on our um, music programming for this school year, as well as what the future will look like. Um, we're gonna format it in a sense of a current state and next steps in the areas of elementary, middle school, and high school. At the middle school and high school, we're gonna look at curricular and then extracurricular at the high school uh, curricular and extracurricular as well. So, and then uh, Leslie will take over from there once we get our kind of current state and talk to the group of our next steps along with some fantastic teachers that we have that will be presenting as well. I'll try to be as brief as possible to get to the most important folks which are waiting to speak to you and our teachers. Uh, currently, our, our, our elementary curricular programming um, for, for those folks, our elementary music staff are being used to provide specials to all students, uh, which then offers planning periods and lunch for our core teachers. They are the centerpiece of how we are able to have in-person learning happening at our elementary. And that's also true for our middle school as well, as they provide so many opportunities for our teachers to get their planning periods, which are contractual, as well as their lunch time. So with, honestly, I can say without them, uh, this, this model of, of in-person would not have been possible. In addition to that, at our current state for our middle school, uh, uh, curricular and extracurricular, on the curricular side, currently all of our middle school's music staff are being used to provide those specials and offer planning periods. But in addition to that, uh, at all three of our middle schools, they either have active plans or upcoming plans very soon to offer music programming during the school day. In addition to that, at uh, the extracurricular act, uh, level, PRMS and Wide Oak Middle School are pursuing and, or currently offering after school music options. So that is what's happening at the middle school. For our high school, uh, both high schools are offering curricular music bells during what they call the zero or eighth bell in person. And so that is at the very beginning of the day or at the very, very end of the day. They've built in time for that. In addition to that, uh, the high school's extra extracurricular programming, Corian High School is offering band and choir extracurricular programs, which would include marching band, winter winds, and show cards. Northwest High School offering band as an extracurricular program as well in the marching band. And a bit of a limited uh, fashion, the night lights program uh, is scheduled during their eighth bell. So quite a bit happening. I'm gonna turn things over now to Leslie to talk to us about next steps and, uh, and to hear from those teachers. Leslie, go ahead. 
Thanks, Dustin. Um, first of all, I just want to recognize and welcome um, the music teachers that we have here with us tonight. Um, we have Sarah Boys, uh, a music teacher at Pleasant Run Elementary. We have Glenn Greenwood. He is a band teacher at Pleasant Run Middle. Uh, we have Tim Huning, band teacher from Northwest High School. Um, Angela Jackson is here with us. She's an orchestra teacher at Coleraine High School and Jacob Page, who is a band teacher at Coleraine High School. Um, some of them are gonna speak to you about some exciting um, things that we have coming up in terms of recruiting and some planning for um, some summer activities, um, but all of them are here to answer any questions you may have about their specific music area and grade level um, if there's questions at the end. So um, we know that this has been a really tough year um, just in general, but it's been especially hard for music um, due to some of the regulations and things that we've faced. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that um, we're actively working to rebuild the music program. And we know that's not gonna happen overnight, um, but we wanna start that sooner rather than later um, because music is so important in the Northwest Oakville schools. So um, a great thing that Tim Huning um, had found is a recruitment website called Be Part of the Music. So Tim, I'm gonna hand it over to you and pull up the site and you can talk me through it. All right, so what this is, is I attended a webinar hosted by the people at Be Part of the Music. And what you end up getting is they create a website that you can use. And on this, it'll give you information and stuff that you can use. So let's, if we scroll down. So the first part, it just gives some stats. That's some stuff about um, music and how students perform that are involved in music classes. Um, as you scroll down again, you get what is band, so it kind of explains that anybody can play an instrument and um, a short video for parents to watch. I'll be perfectly honest, they had a sample one. The message from the director is something you can copy and paste and just put in your school information. And as we keep going, videos that demonstrate all the instruments in this year of COVID where you can't really get instruments in kids' hands um, from a music dealership like we've always done, they can at least hear it. Um, interviews from parents and students, so you kind of see how parents and students from a certain school that they were able to use, how they feel about music in their schools. Um, the next thing, it's a little match game you can do with the kid that the kids can do at home. Um, they fill in their information, then there's a listening challenge. Seven examples on pitch, melody, and rhythm. So telling if the pitch is the same, different, higher, lower, or the same, and then the rhythm and melody, are they the same or different? You can fill in characteristics and put your the kid's preference in there for instruments and submit that to the teacher. And then to me, the biggest, most important part of this is the very end. If the kid's interested in joining band, the parent can fill out the form and it will send the submission to whichever teacher it's assigned to go to. So for Northwest and Pleasant Run, it's assigned to go to Glenn. So that way, if a kid's interested in sixth grade band, he gets the information, he's able to reach out to those kids um, to get instruments and anything else for them. So that to me seemed like a very good website and all of this was put together for us. We didn't have to do anything really and they put all this together. And then the second site we they put together was their recruitment dashboard. And again, this is stuff that we fill in, we choose, and this is supposed to be three weeks to 30% improvement in your numbers. So you end up putting in what your goals are, you choose some recruitment team, which are students they say you should use. And then to me, the most important part of this, if you look at all the tabs at the bottom of the screen, the enrollment one, let's not click on, that shows Absolutely. the students and parents' emails for stuff that we have, but then they have a whole bunch of documents that are ready to use. Um, videos that we can choose from that talk about beginning band, beginning orchestra, staying in middle school, staying in high school, pre-written emails, social media images you can use, and then they have an impact report, which is this is numbers and stuff for us to figure out, like how has COVID affected our numbers in all sorts of things, 
So just something for us to use in order to track everything as well. The enrollment page is the really important one. I don't want to put that up because I have populated it with parents' emails and stuff. But with that, you can track the kids who have decided to enroll back in the program and things from that. And the best part of all this is it costs absolutely nothing, and we can share this out with anybody and everybody. Thanks, Tim. So they're actively using this at Northwest and um, Pleasant Run Middle School and um, the teachers um, at White Oak Coleraine Middle Coleraine High School are aware of this and are looking at it as well to see if they're going to create kind of their own version of that. And like Tim said, it's a template that's created and shared. Um, so it's free for our teachers to use. Um, now Jacob's going to talk about um, an exciting thing that's kind of we're planning. Um, so Jacob, you want to take it over? Sure. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just really excited before we get started to uh, to be with you guys tonight. Thanks for asking for this information and uh, reaching out to us to make sure that this happens. Something that we wanted to uh, talk about was summer camps. Obviously, those have been things that have happened for AP classes, honor students, especially at the high school level. But we wanted to make sure that there was an option for uh, music for this summer as well. Um, so again, as Leslie pointed out, that this is very much in the preliminary stages. Um, and it's it may look a little different for choir and orchestra and band at different levels. But these are just some of the ideas that I kind of put together talking with um, a few of the other teachers in the district. Uh, we looked at doing something in June, maybe at the end of the school year and possibly in July, um, particularly in July, because that would be leading up to things like band camp at the high schools and things like that. So that would be an opportunity for us to to reach out to those students that aren't in uh, involved in those marching band activities um, to see if that's something they wanted to do. Um, we talked about the idea of using staff from all different buildings and through across the district. Um, including some of those teachers that would might be beginning band teachers um, that students would already know and have a relationship with. We wanted to put together an opportunity for students that have at more of a beginner side of things for students that haven't gotten to play. Um, so that would be primarily around our sixth grade, um, seventh grade current students that have had some band orchestra choir experience, um, but obviously things got cut short with COVID and things like that. Then we also wanted to look at an intermediate camp for our students that were a little bit more advanced in those years, um, our seventh, maybe eighth graders, um, and even including maybe some of our freshmen this year that were remote learners that we would want to try to get them back and involved and interested in these opportunities for us. We talked about some ideas of where those might be happening on campus. If that's going to be, you know, in one particular high school and we have all of the band kids there for a couple of days together or orchestra or uh, or choir, excuse me, and any version of that um, as might happen. Um, some of the things that band wise that I can speak to a little bit, um, we talked a little bit about the opportunity of performing for the community um, at Coleraine Park, possibly in uh, the, the open theater there so that we can observe some of the COVID precautions while still being able to reach out into the community, have concerts and things like that. Um, we also talked about, again, combining that middle school, high school staff, um, as well as maybe some of the elementaries that would be doing the beginning band thing um, to, again, build those relationships within our community and within our music department. Thanks, Tim. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. Um, Angela, do you have anything specific you want to talk about orchestra? Um, I would just echo um, thanks for having us tonight and for, for caring and um, being ready to take this opportunity to move forward better um, than we were before. Um, I'd like to just say quickly, um, I'd like to recognize Cassie Crawford from Northwest and Pleasant Run Middle, who is working diligently to um, beef up our music presence in our district website. Um, we're all kind of working together with her on that, but she's spearheading it. And um, as far as um, moving forward with summer programs, uh, she and I have talked about combining our both sides of the district to come together for strings. Uh, it's the kind of thing that we do throughout the year um, 
occasionally anyway. And to get that started in a summer program would be a great opportunity for us and our students. Um, again, from the elementary level to the middle school, making a comment, um, having some kind of experience for those kids. And then of course, um, from the middle school level, moving up into the high school to encourage them to get to know each other across the district in an orchestra situation. So um, really excited that uh, we're taking this opportunity to kind of rethink uh, our mission for music education in our district. Thank you. Um, anyone else have anything they wanna say, Sarah or Glenn? Otherwise we'll turn it over for questions from the board. Greenwood has to say something. <laughs> um, I'm sitting in a parking lot waiting to pick up my daughter in my car. I'm just kind of <laughs> listening along right now. You forgot to tell him you share Jesus's birthday. Yeah, that's 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 one of the main reasons why I'm so awesome. <laughs> hey guys, this is Todd. Do you have the instruments you need to have camps in the summer? Is that a problem since the kids didn't get the instruments to start the school year? Tim or Jacob? If I could speak from a band perspective, um, we honestly won't know how many we'll need for all of that kind of stuff until we kind of see what students are, are interested in it. I know summertime is sometimes, um, you know, vacations for a lot of people and things like that. So we won't really know the numbers until we start putting information together with dates and things like that. Um, but it's definitely something to consider. Will we have enough instruments for those students to use and how we'll be able to function with that for sure. Because that'd be something if you could keep us in the know so we can help out with that in whatever way possible. Sure, we'd be glad to do that. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, I know that with this uh, season that we've been through, that there's been an exodus of kids in the program. Uh, do we have any idea? Do we have any percentages of how many how many uh, students we've lost in the in the program? Um, if you're talking about in building, I'm down to about. 38% that are actually in the building, but in terms of attrition, I can just say a bunch. Um, I've sent you all the emails that I've gotten, but uh, I could probably count 10 or 15 that have just decided not to do it because of, you know, the weird situation that we're in that I'm familiar with. Is, is, that, a, is that a trend that's happening at all the schools? Do you, do you guys hear that? I can tell you for um, Coleraine High School Band, we're looking at um, uh, an attrition rate of almost 65% of students between last year and this year, um, not including uh, any of our incoming freshmen. Um, we're about 65% smaller this year than we were last year. It's, it's also difficult to, to gauge attrition right now because I only see a, so, a very small amount of kids in the building and you know being new to the building i'm supposed to have like a hundred and something kids from last year and i'm i'm down under about 40 that are, are actually on my roster because the nti kids uh don't have band so it, it's hard to gauge but i know we're down down pretty good i know i had 70 last year in my curricular classes and this year i have about 20 if i'm lucky I'm down uh, in orchestra at Coleraine High School, just below 50% um, participation. I do have some kids that are remote that are still hanging in there, and then some kids that are in person. Um, but like they said, I've, I've lost some just because they just didn't want to deal with trying to do um, a, a zero bell and then go back home or um, try to do it remotely. Um, middle school at Coleraine, um, they're about, they're less than 50% participating from last year's numbers. And at White Oak, of course, there's no string teaching happening from what I understand. 
I'm, I know there might be a few that come back the next year. I'm trying to reach out to them. Well, what, this is Todd again, what helps your numbers? Is it more staff recruiting and keeping the program separate? Because I know it's very difficult in the elementary world because you basically have one music teacher at each building and to be able to teach chorus, band, and orchestra and have that skill set is very difficult. So is it having the flexibility of teachers moving from skill to skill and keeping a program in each building or is it the combination of moving the kids and combining the programs. What do you guys see as a better fit? My my first thought to that would be uh, staffing and giving us the flexibility to support each other in co-teaching models. Uh, definitely keep each program separate so that it can build back into the flourishing programs that we had. Um, I think combining um, traveling students is kind of not a great use of their time in school. Um, having the teachers have the flexibility to move from building to building and co-teach and help support each other that way. The kids make, um, they make relationships. They Their relationships seem to be, oh, I'm, okay. <laughs> The relationships that they form with their teachers are some of the most um, important parts of their memories. When they write about their orchestra memories, for me, it's it's connections with their teacher and their classmates. Well, the only reason I ask is I'm not, I don't want the public to think we're spending general fund money, but we have these ESSER funds. And so Amy and I are talking about putting a presentation together on ESSER funds and what it means. And so we could talk about that, but it, it's about makeup learning. This is exactly what that is. Their, band, their programs have been cut and destroyed because uh, all your performance seasons were canceled. Uh, sure. And then you put kids on remote learning. So it is very difficult. So I, I watch Angela every year try to go to the high school, then go try to teach at a middle school. And then she also shows up at these elementary conferences and she can't develop relationships with the kids. And then her travel bells causes her to lose teaching time. So it's more about having the skill set to develop relationships with the kids and gain their interest. Um, and then another question I had is, so I know sports, when we first went with Butler Tech, the big thing was we have great programs at Butler Tech, so our kids go there and we worried about them not wanting sports. So Tim at Northwest, are you losing a lot of band kids at Butler Tech? And can, now that they have that fifth day of internships, is there anything we can do to make sure those kids are staying and participating in band and staying active? Or Jacob, are you seeing that at Colerain? Are we keeping those kids involved? Because we've got great opportunities at Butler Tech, but are we losing kids from band or chorus or night lights or show cards that way? From the Colerain perspective, I can tell you, we give our students the opportunity to participate in marching bands still if they're doing on campus with Butler Tech and things like that. I know um, there's a handful of them that participate in show cards and winning wins and things like that. Um, but as, as part of the school day, uh, we're, we're, we've taken a big impact with Butler Tech and students not being able to be in the classroom for those curricular classes, for sure. So it gets tough. If they don't want to stay after school, then you do take a chance on them. Okay. Tim, what Correct. about you? It's, it's up to the student then to decide. I will agree with Jacob. I look our list for uh, Northwest for next year and sophomores and juniors alone, it appears that I have about 46% of my current band kids on the list to go to Butler Tech. And we're going to lose them from the curricular part of the day. We leave the door open for the extracurricular part, but they're losing a whole lot of the pedagogy involved in playing their instrument from not being in the classroom. So maybe it's, it's worth a discussion on how to arrange their days and our scheduling of when they have their cores. Because it's the skill set part that is very important to the Butler Tech programs and the hands-on piece, which is basically the same for you guys. Just trying to think of how to improve your numbers and everything that's affecting it. Andy, you have a question? 
Well, I, I, originally I was going to ask, um, how many have you lost many of the kids to Butler Tech that have gone into their music program? But when I hear 40-something, I know not that many all went to the music program. Clearly, they're in a lot of different programs. Normally, for band, we're not losing a lot to the uh, Butler Tech music program. We're losing them to every other program that's up there. Um, our choir has taken more of a hit with the School of the Arts than band side. Um, and I know that there have been discussions about how do we incorporate those students um, into the extracurricular since they're choosing to go there instead of to the curricular programs Alfred at the school. I'm going to throw out there that um, for in the orchestra world we just really don't have the extracurricular programs established that they do in band and choir and so when we lose a kid uh, as a junior we lose them forever. Um, it would be my hope that all the students even in Butler Tech programs would be able to continue doing music as a lifelong learning uh, aspect. So I, if there's a way we could adjust schedules and allow Butler Tech kids to participate in all of our curricular music ensembles, that would be a dream come true. We definitely lose orchestra students. I have, um, I would have had a class of about 12 seniors this year and I have one. All to Butler Tech. Well, you, you know, we just made it through a pandemic, so I'm just throwing things out here. So if we take a later bus up to Butler Tech and they could stay for Bell One of Orchestra at Coleraine High School, then they do a, a remote learning class at home to maybe get whatever social studies or science class they're missing, and then they get their Butler Tech courses in. I mean, I just think we got to start thinking I mean, differently on how we do these things. I mean, you guys are redesigning both high schools, so... Now's the time. I mean, we've already proven we can do a lot of things this year. So, and Butler Tech is open to anything. That's the great thing about them. They redesign, rethink. It, we just got to open up those lines of communication. And now that they have that Friday internship day, I, I just think if that could add kids back to your guys' programs, then we try to think any way we can. You mentioned how I travel all over the place. I'd be happy to travel up and do a Butler Tech Orchestra. Well, I know, but that's a 35-minute trip. I already thought of that. <laughs> oh, well, that's okay. I'll do it. Take one for the team. Yeah, you can eat lunch while you're there, too. It's good. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I do think that would be a win-win a because in talking to students, some of them struggle with they want to do a Butler Tech program, but they don't want to leave something that they're doing in their normal day at the high school and it, it's kind of a real struggle of which they want to do so if the more opportunities we could come up with so that they don't have to give up something to do something else would be great. I, I love the camps idea. I, I hope um, that that's successful to get kids. I mean I'm hoping by summer kids are, are going to want to do things and that's a way to see their friends too and just start building your programs back up. I think it's going to take a while, though. It's a shame. Yeah, um, I, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of you. Um, I, I think back when, uh, it, uh, Glenn, you probably remember this, when Brandon started playing uh, sax early, early, early uh, in his middle school career. And I think anybody that's had a, a student in band or choir or any of, the, any of the performing arts, I remember the very first concert I heard. And we just kept smiling. <laughs> we just kept smiling, even though it may not have been the best. And then I watch my son in jazz band when he's in high school, and I look at from point A to point B, or you know, as they're wrapping up. And that's that's an incredibly unique experience in their educational career. They probably develop deeper, deeper relationships with their educators in this platform than in any other. The only thing that I can say comes close to that is maybe. The football program where you're doing you know you're lifting after school and you're seeing your coach day in and day out music is the only thing i think i've ever seen like that other than that um so the importance of that is amazing um and the relationship that the kids have with uh their teachers like i know when jacob page's uh kids showed up at school i know because my daughter comes home and talks about it Oh, they were doing this, they were doing that, and, and I've got like eight million stories for Glenn Greenwood. Uh, we won't even go into them. 
Um, but that's what makes my daughter enjoy, like it, it's very relational. Um, and, and, and that has to start very early in their educational careers. They need to see Jacob's face early in their career. They need to see Angela's face early in their career so that they have something to look forward to because they know who's there when they get there. Um, I've had this conversation with a couple of you. So as you build this program, obviously keep that. And I know that you guys were talking about maybe visiting other schools and, and making yourself known uh, to the kids. Um, you know, I, I just say, if you need anything, reach out to us because we support you 100%. Yeah, I can say from our perspective, uh, Mr. Fisher has been super awesome about letting myself and Angela and, uh, and Mr. Huffaker, Blake Huffaker as well, um, start working on, you know, being at White Oak, being at Coleraine um, two days a week so that we can make sure that we're developing those relationships and working with those um, teachers over there as well. Um, I just can't say enough of thanks for that because it's, it's going to be a huge help to these students to know you know, hey, I'm going to see Mr. Page in sixth grade, and now I'm going to go and see him all the way through 12th grade kind of thing as we continue on here. Um, I, I can't agree enough with you on that one, Mr. Gilbert, that the relationships that we get to build, that our other music teachers get to build, um, that's just unlike anything else um, in the thing. Because if you think about it, these students are some of the only students that we see for four years in a row, and that's only at the high school. Um, you're not counting the eighth graders that might be in marching band or, you know, the one concert that I get to see those eighth graders and, and perform with them. So um, I, again, agree that the relationship is the, the key fundamental here um, for all of our students and staff members to be successful. I wonder if, I mean, normally I would say let's get some of these kids and take them to the elementaries and the middle schools, but of course it's COVID. But I wonder when you go, or even the days you're not there, if maybe during lunchtime or whatever, something like this can be set up where there's just maybe some concerts being played or shows the jazz band or show choirs or the orchestra or some of the smaller groups and what they've done in the past and maybe not even this year, maybe when your program was even bigger, just, you know, that kid's sitting there eating and might see something that, wow, that looks neat or I never knew you could do that, you know, especially at the elementary level because um, like Mark said, I think you've, you've got to get the interest started in the elementary level. And I mean, I just remember I played the flute and started in the fourth grade. And I remember by the time I got, I guess, to junior high and then saw jazz band, I remember thinking, I want to do that. And then I realized, you know, I didn't know when I picked the flute that that isn't part of a jazz band. I was only in the fourth grade. And, I just always remember thinking that jazz band was just so cool. So I don't know, I think the more it could come up with ways to do stuff at the elementary level, it would help. And, and now that this is our world that we live in doing this kind of stuff, just putting screens up in, in all the cafeterias and that, you know, during the lunch time and just have, you know, background and playing it. I mean, if it gets you three people, there's three kids that it just made a huge difference. So might be an idea. Yeah. I, uh, I remember when Mr. Page uh, had some some uh, of the students come to my church and play Christmas music right around the Christmas season. And if, if we did something like that at the elementary where you had some high school kids playing during lunch mm -hmm. uh, to spark interest. And Angela, one thing that I really like, I love the idea of combining the campuses with your initiative. Um, who knows when we're gonna go through another pandemic or another situation Gosh. that's gonna limit um, the productivity of some of these programs. And if we can start developing the synergy of doing a, a, a connectivity between the campuses now, um, at least then we'll have some experience and some miles underneath our feet that says, well, if we're gonna do that, this is how we've done it in the past. Uh, and it, what all you're doing is creating an environment where the kids still have an outlet to do something versus having to take time to try to rebuild it and you're gonna lose a subset of kids like virtually immediately um, and having this as a potential contingency plan uh, in the event that something like this happens plus it's always awesome when you get the kids together and they all just play like it's I mean that's what it's all about anyway so uh, I love that idea um, we just we never know what's coming our way and and having these out-of-the-box thinking like Todd was sharing I think these are 
These are all great solutions. Uh, this could be one of the blessings in the pandemic for your program long term that we're, we're putting this thing on a different microscope slide and looking at it from a different perspective. So I appreciate you guys uh, presenting and, and being here and, and containing Glenn Greenwood for this amount of time. And I would say all, like I know that the night lights has taken a big hit. So um, getting some videos of previous years of the night lights at the elementary level and the middle school level to spark some interest of these kids that, you know, they might have never seen anything like that before. I mean, that, that might help. I do know that Blake Huffaker was working on something for that perspective for um, Coleraine Middle and White Oak as well. Um, I don't know about the, the other side of things, but I know Blake was doing a lot of recruitment um, through videos and things like that since he knew he couldn't see students in person. Do the parents fear COVID for the, with band more than like anything that you've seen? Like, has that, have you heard that as, as some of the kids are, are exiting? Is it because of fear or is it like, I know my daughter, she plays at like, I think it's 7.30 in the morning. Sometimes that's my alarm clock. Um, it, you know, it, is that because that's different? Is that what is causing kids to lose interest is the not being around it and having the social piece of it? Or are parents actually afraid that it could be a super spreader for lack of a better word? Have you heard with my experience that? so far it's a really minimal amount of students and parents that feel that this is a super spreader activity um, i think it is it is very different than some people are used to and that difference kind of pushed some people um, out of the way as well you know it's not going to look the same it's going to be in a different room um, you know speaking to the marching band perspective it's not going to be competitive and things like that um, i know it was it was much more of that side of things than specific to the pandemic and spreading. I think with my students who are not participating this year, it's more of a situation where remote learning um, is very individual. And when you're playing by yourself, it's just you. And a lot of what they want from the program is this camaraderie and the relationship piece that you just talked about earlier. Um, when you're at home and you're part of a Zoom meeting and when you play together, all you can hear is yourself. It's um, uh, it's like a microscope on your playing. It's a little scary. And they don't have that camaraderie that brought them to the group in the first place. That making music together is what the perk and they're not getting that at all. And so I have students that just said, I can't do this together with you because I'm a remote student. I can't come in for the zero bell or the eighth bell. And so I'm just gonna lay out this year and hopefully they'll come back. Sure. I think some of mine have just decided not to do it because of the timing of things. When um, first bell starts at, or the cohort time starts at 8.10, it's kind of difficult sometimes if you have a sibling or something that has to be dropped off at a different time, or if you have siblings that are getting picked up at the end of the day on parents to pick them up at two different times. You know, what, what were the numbers? Have the numbers been going down, like, say, the last four or five years before the pandemic, before this happened? How are, how are the numbers, you know, like I said, the last four or five years before this? I mean, were, are they, were they, staying, they numbers going down? Were they going up? My numbers at Northwest were climbing steadily um, throughout the last four or five years going into the pandemic. And then this year it just like jumped off the cliff. Orchestra's been holding steady. Um, I think increasing some at Northwest. I don't know, Tim, you might be able to speak to that better than I can. But um, Store, um, numbers holding steady. Butler Tech taking my upperclassmen more than anything, but um, other than that, uh, not a lot of attrition from eighth grade to high school. They've been hanging in there. From my perspective over at Coleraine, um, we kind of 
four years ago was my first year, so there was a little bit of a drop in numbers there. Um, but we were actually sitting around 117 different students um, in band classes, and a handful of them, probably about 22, um, were doubling in that jazz band thing as well. So, um, and that wasn't including any uh, middle school students that would have been in marching band or anything like that. So my numbers were were going up fairly strongly there um, for the last two years, and then. Um, we took a pretty big dive this year, for sure. And Angela's the orchestra at Northwest. Yeah, we've been holding steady at least freshman and sophomore year. And again, taking that hit when they get to be juniors from Butler Tech and everything on that program. Thank you. Right. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks guys. Thanks for having us. Night. Have a good evening. All right. Our next presentation is from M.A. Murray, who is the principal at the Houston Early Learning Center. And she has a uh, highlight of a slideshow of what's going on at Houston Early Learning Center. So at this time, we'll turn it over to M.A. Murray. M.A., you out there? Yes. Thank you very <laughs> much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the uh, former presentation. Uh, I think it's um, so important to, uh, to be talking about the fine arts. But I'm here this evening as a Houston Early Learning Center's principal and to share with you uh, through the pandemic our relentless focus on literacy. So I'm going to share with you uh, a few slides and some information. Uh, that I think you will find very valuable. So, am, do I need to share the uh, PowerPoint? If, if you or could, if, it'd be good. Oh, okay. My apologies. I didn't know if I was sharing I it or not. I just we'd have it both ways. Yes, it isn't. Is it sharing yet? No, we have it here. I just didn't know if you could show it there. So you can go ahead. If you can see it on yours, we can see it here behind us. I was trying to get it so it was in front of other people. Gotcha. As long as, long as you all can see it, I can go ahead and present. Okay. So uh, if you go down to the first line, it's we are uh, very proud of the fact that that we are a five-star rated school. Uh, we have continued to receive our five-star rating through the Ohio Department of Education. So that is definitely uh, something that is a cumulative uh, effort that takes everybody in the building, all the staff, uh, all the teachers, uh, Mrs. Obermeyer, myself, uh, everyone is committed to being uh, a five-star school. 80% of our students who attend Houston Early Learning Center enter kindergarten on track as defined by the state of Ohio. Just to go through very quickly, we have 11 full-time licensed teachers. We have eight special ed preschool interventionists. We have five preschool educators with master's degrees. 
We have three experienced and licensed gen ed assistants and eight experienced licensed special ed assistants. What do we support? Well, we have six typical classrooms that can uh, support up to 144 four-year-old students. We have 10 classrooms that typically serve eight uh, students that are threes and fours that are typically developing and eight students of typical education that the disability. We have four cross pedagogical classrooms that can serve up to 16 students. So where are we in terms of our relentless focus on literacy? Uh, just going to share with you some photos. Uh, we definitely embrace uh, literature. Uh, young students certainly uh, learn so much through uh, literature. We make sure that our our uh, libraries, our in-school libraries, are filled with uh, books that are meaningful and relevant and diversified for varying interests. So books are definitely a foundational aspect for what we do each and every day at Houston. Just wanted to uh, say thank you for our lending library. Each uh, school has been uh, uh, received funding library and ours is definitely in usage and that helps to support our ongoing literacy. Here are some of our uh, wonderful teachers uh, sharing with their students even during the uh, pandemic. Uh, some they're not wearing their masks so these were pre-pandemic but uh, we take full advantage of uh, the importance of literature whether it be inside the classroom or in the middle, uh, we have beautiful grounds. So we take every opportunity to get those students outside and enjoy uh, literature or any other type of curriculum. Here's an example of one of Lois Ehlert's uh, wonderful books about leaves and incorporating that component of literature with the student on the right, no Emmy. She's making a beautiful leaf butterfly, uh, an extension from the book uh, outside on our freshly painted uh, playground. We, uh, we love really uh, getting into the book, uh, into the character, into whatever's happening in, in the book. This one is called I Stink. And uh, the students absolutely love this book. It just, this depicts here how they are uh, able to retell it through a pictorial. Predicting stories is a big component of our uh, foundation of our curriculum. So uh, here is uh, Mrs. Geisler. She is uh, uh, preparing the students uh, with her book and what foretelling uh, what may be coming next. This is a student, uh, one way to understand our symbols of the alphabet, he's doing a matching. Being able to find their name is a learning goal, drawing and making symbols. Writing their name is, is one of our learning goals. And here we embrace what's called the handwriting without tears curriculum. Down, if you scroll back up, Mrs. Bibb um, is doing a representation of what we call Mat Man. The students learn the parts of their body through the wooden pieces, and then later on, those pre pre uh, prepare the student for the foundation of also learning each of the uppercase letters. Here are some of their interpretation and reflections of their Mat Man. They line our hallways. Again, the students work together to create the mat man. Uh, writing, as you know, is an important part of our curriculum. And each classroom has a writing area filled with multiple materials for the students be, to be able to choose and interact with. Here's a nice uh, picture of a student. Uh, she's emerging into her literacy. You can see the journal on the right. Uh, she gets to circle which one she feels best represents the letter that she's working on. And the, uh, the, the student on the right is just lots and lots of uh, her letters 
or coming into uh, formation. And uh, so that's her pre-writing skill. We go through a lot of environmental print. Students bring in things from their environment and then they're categorized alphabetically. There are more students journaling, students uh, becoming illustrators in their journal, uh, writing about what they saw or what they listened to in, in the books. There are different ways to communicate. As you know, we have a large population of special education students and these represent different ways that we embrace literature. We do Venn diagrams. Uh, this one, uh, they're going back, uh, shows is the Venn, uh, which one's fiction, which one's nonfiction, and, and how in the middle, uh, what's common between the two books. Uh, thank you to Northwest for our wonderful playground. We also use our environmental print outside to help the students support that literacy book and a copy, uh, just practicing their C's or word walls. Now, this part here, I just wanted uh, to go back uh, as uh, we have uh, been conversing today amongst administrators and, and different people at, at uh, Northwest, the excitement uh, of returning to what we term is what, what would be normal. So I wanted just to focus a little bit on what uh, we do do at HELC and we're very excited to return to that sense of normalcy. So here are some of our Hallmark events. This is Mother's Day. This is our library with uh, Grosbeck interacting. We have our computer lab, our outdoor playground, our learning lab, we have our gymnasium. This is uh, Dad's Day. Grandparents' Day, Read With Your Child Day, our time with Daddy, our wonderful spring concert, our moments with Mom, and ongoing student events that support literacy in every way, our fall celebration, our Community Helpers Day. And as we were talking about music, we love Mark Razio. He comes to uh, our school each year and presents a wonderful magical experience. We just want to thank you uh, for listening to our presentation, sharing a little bit uh, about our journey, uh, how we celebrate and really uh, uh, have in our forefront the relentless focus on literacy. And also a little uh, plug, I uh, want to remind everybody that we are actively and currently taking enrollment for all preschool students, uh, especially for next year. Uh, so if you are interested, which I'm sure you are, if you have a student who will be turning three or four years of age, you can pick up an enrollment pack, packet at any of our elementary schools. Uh, if you're not at an elementary school, you can certainly come by Houston Early Learning Center and Mrs. Obermeyer will be happy to uh, get a packet in your hand. Once you do, just go ahead and make an appointment with Mrs. Obermeyer and she will uh, walk you through our enrollment process and answer any of the questions that you may or may not have. So uh, we just wish you all uh, a safe uh, rest of our school year and know that uh, even though you can't come and visit us in person, we're actively working to put together uh, some videos that you can visit us uh, at Houston Early Learning Center. And thank you so much. Thank you for your ongoing support. Any questions for May? It's impressive, very impressive what you do to build a foundation for these kids. Great presentation. Yeah, that's a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, we love our teachers, our staff, uh, Mrs. Obermeyer, our custodians, uh, our nurse. They all work together as a great team. So uh, the parents, are awesome and uh, the families and of course the children so we wouldn't have a school without those great those great children so yeah you're welcome anytime <laughs> thank you so much thank you thanks thank you thanks so much.
Okay, next on the agenda item is legislative updates. Are there any legislative updates? Okay, uh, not a whole lot's been going on since our last meeting two weeks ago, except we did have in both the, uh, in the Senate, they passed, both of these are on the ex uh, establishing a residential broadband expansion program. And the Senate passed their bill, Senate Bill 8, by a vote of 32 to 0. And the House has their version, House Bill 2, that they passed by a vote of 91 to 5. So uh, that tells me that both the House and the Senate definitely want to do something as far as expanding broadband into the statewide. And uh, so it looks real positive that they'll come together and send something to the governor. And then uh, it's also uh, Todd's going to speak about uh, House Bill 67. That's all I have. I'll do it in my update part. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Uh, student achievement. Um, I've, I've got a long list here of a lot of kids to congratulate. I think part of it, I'm probably stepping on Butler Tech Report because most of this is Butler Tech programs, <laughs> but um, I don't think he'll mind if I try to get all these names right, <laughs> so I'll try my best. First of all, a big congratulations to Anna Lou Gaynor, Horain High School senior, who is one of five students chosen throughout the state of Ohio as the 2021 CTE Presidential Scholar nominee. This award, which is given in partnership with the Ohio Association for Career and Technical Education and the Ohio Department of Education Office of CTE, identifies outstanding career technical students to be recognized as part of the U.S. Department of Education National Presidential Scholars Program. So huge congratulations to Anna Lou. Also congratulations to Colerain High School seniors Alexander Thornikoff and Sophia Bitt for being named National Merit Finalists. This award is given to students with the highest PSAT NMSQT selection index scores and puts both students in the running to receive a merit scholarship award. So best of luck and congratulations to both of them. Now here we go with our students that are part of the Butler Tech programs. Business Professionals of America, also known as BPA, recently held their regional competition. The following students will go to represent Coleraine High School, Northwest High School, and Butler Tech in the BPA state competition in March. Junior state qualifiers are Josh Kappel, placed first in Fundamentals of Web Design. Denise Adekiera, placed second in the SQL Database Programming and second in Fundamentals of Web Design. Melvin Stockton, placed first in Integrated Office Application Software. Austin Yates, placed second in Integrated Office Application Software. Um, Josiah, Jackson placed first in digital media production, and Jonah McKee placed second in PC servicing and troubleshooting. Our senior state qualifiers are Perry Lee placed first in the SQL database programming. Perry placed first in two events, so great job, Perry. Amaya Bryant, Tone Guyen, Perry Lee, and Brandon Sinclair placed first in web design team. The Hintanashu Byatt will be replacing Perry on the team because Perry can only advance in one event. He chose to advance and complete an SQL. Matthew Rich and Austin Brauner placed first in uh, computer animation team. Sanchin Hungle placed second in PC security. Nick Brinkler placed second in networking technology. So good luck and congratulations to all of them. Here are the BPA state qualifiers, qualifiers from financial services. Miles Blackwell, small business management team. Robbie Brocker, business law and ethics. Francis Bungabong, banking and finance. Ryan Deringer, payroll accounting. Aliyah Douglas, advanced office. Anna Lou Gaynor, banking and finance. And Gabriella Harper, personal financial management. We'll have more. Landon Hill, Graphic Design Promotion. Morgan Hines, Economic Research Team. Alexis Hughes, Economic Research Team. Stephen Lance, Business Law and Ethics. Nick Moore, Payroll Accounting. 
Namaro Puyol, Fundamental Word, Trinity Robinson, Human Resource Management, and Adam Rowland, Small Business Management Team, Javon Smith, Interview Skills, Angel Soriano, Economic Research Team, Seth Warren, Small Business Management Team, and Isaac White's Small Business Management Team. So good luck and congratulations to all of them. The BPA Digital Media Program State Qualifiers are Aaron Abraha, Gabe Brodus, Emerson Chilila, Keonan Paul, Jordan Hammonds, Damian Houston, Tia Jordan, Michael Posey, Ellis Smith, and Lane Smith. Students that earned medals but didn't qualify state are listed below. All of these students only missed advancing to the state by one spot. For test events, first and second place advance. For judged events, only first place advances. So Eliza Smith placed second in extramonious speech. He's a junior. Brian Dillinger and Johiza Jackson placed second in video production team, and they are juniors. Trevin West, Austin Yates, and Melvin Stockton placed second in web design team. They are also juniors. Ethan Meyer placed third in PC security. He's a senior. And Nick Brinker placed third in SQL database programming. He's a senior, and he's going to stay in the networking technology. So a lot of, lot of success with the Butler Tech kids and these state competitions and we want to wish them all the best of luck and congratulations to all of them. You know, Thank Pam, you. those CTSOs that you were just reading on that, I mean, that's just like, you know, at the regular high schools, the athletic team is where they compete and go to state and get in the playoffs. This is their, if you want to call it that, their, their big thing at the end of the year. It's just as important to them as the athletics are to, you know, the rest of the kids that, you know, are at their home schools and that competing in sports and athletics and, and band and, and and that kind of stuff, you know, when they compete. So this is this is their if you want to call it their athletics or whatever, um, their competition. And and I would say from both high schools they're very represented across yep, the board. They are. And um, for the kids that um, got the medals but missed by going to state by one point you can see the majority of them are juniors. So hopefully we'll be seeing them in person at a board meeting next year. And um, just excited, this is exciting news. Just miss seeing all of you here, but good luck. That's all. That was an incredible list. Oh, I need a drink of water. Yeah, that's impressive. I agree, some of those names. Uh, yeah. yeah exactly. And I apologize. Exactly. I, I know I botched a couple. I apologize. Okay, next, Butler Tech. Can you follow that up, dear Jim? You know, I got just a couple things I can't follow up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, I did get an email today where they are extending a week for the signups for the classes for next year, and then they'll do their interviews. Just to give you an example, there's eight, well, there was 800, there's 800 spots at Butler Tech through the four campuses. They had 2,400 kids sign up wow. to get to those. So this is very, very competitive when they interview these kids for these spots on all these different programs. This is this is no kidding around. This is the real deal. You know, you have this many kids that sign up. Um, but then we had a presentation last Tuesday uh, at the, for the Natural Science Center where we're, they're going to be building a new uh, Natural Science Center, there's about 7,000 square feet right now of classrooms and um, science rooms and that. And so we're going, they're going to build a new couple of new buildings and there's going to be 25,000 square feet. So they're almost going to, you know, triple their, over triple their size. Um, it's going to be an $11 million project, which no money was, is asked by from the taxpayers. Everything is is going to be paid through Butler Tech, so you know there's no bond issues or anything like that that were put up. So um, that should be they're going to break ground this June, I believe it is, and they should be ready to go um, 
September of 2022 with the, the new um, Natural Science Center. And I'll, I'll get the video of the presentation that we can put that on the website that uh, people can look at that and see what's coming and see what's going to be all available uh, up there at the Natural Science Center. Sure. Jim, what, is there four programs that are housed there? Yeah, there's the equine science, the vet tech, the um, landscaping, the landscape design, landscaping. Um, there's one more I'm forgetting. Another small animal care or something. Yes, it's not called. It's I think small animal care. I that's not what the, the exact title of. But yeah, I, I can get. Uh, it'll have all the list of what's available out there that uh, kids can apply for. Uh, I mean, our vet tech program was so popular, we had to add another one last year. So you, you've got about 60 kids in the vet tech program alone. Wow. Um, that's how you know popular that, that program is, and it's very good. So uh, that's it. And Todd, who do I need to get that presentation to? Lindsay, she'll get on the website. Yep. Okay, uh, next on the agenda is a uh, report from employee organizations. Todd, are there any? We have none. Okay. Uh, we did not receive any community comments. And that takes us to the approval of the superintendent consent items. Yes, for adoption of the superintendent consent items, we have some retirements and resignations and some uh, retirements of some employees that have been with us for uh, a lot of years and given a lot of um, valuable years for our district and a lot of people that are going to be missed um, as we do every meeting you get to about this time of the year you see some folks who have been around for quite a long time some of them that have taught uh, your kids and, um, we also you will see the promotion of Ollie Moore from an interim position to the principal of Colerain Middle School so we are very proud of that and I'm glad to welcome Ollie aboard um, um, Besides that, we have vendor contracts that are all Title I federal funds, all budgeted for and approved. So the superintendent recommends the Board of Education approve the adoption of the superintendent's consent items as listed. So moved. Second. There is a motion and a second. Are there any questions or comments? There is one name on there I'd like to say thank you to, Aaron McGee, who is just an incredible influence and uh, my son, 24 years old, still stays in contact with her. So thank you for your influence on the thousands of kids that have come your way. And your consent items passed, five to, five to zero. Next are the fiscal consent items, Amy. So good evening. First, we'd like to uh, start with uh, dispense with reading of and approve the January or February 8th meeting minutes that were in the, in the agenda. And our January financial report, we have our all funds balance at about $42.8 million. Our general fund unreserved balance is down to 15 million. And this is timing because we haven't received our first half taxes yet, and taxes are 60% of our revenue. So we're at the bottom of our curve. The revenues for the year are about 51 million, or at 52%, and our expenditures are almost 54 million, or about 55%, and we are 58% so the way for the year at the end of January. So. Both revenue and expenditures slightly below, but again, we are waiting on our first half taxes. Our investment uh, average weighted return was 0.81%, still slowly increasing, but exceeding benchmarks, so we're doing well there. And the list of monthly bills were our routine monthly bills, as well as we had our <coughs> workers' comp excess cost premium. We had some technology repair supplies. We had our annual audit, the PAPR printing, some boiler repairs, and then as we've had all year long, some pandemic supplies, cleaning, PPE, things like that, and auxiliary grant funds and payments. And then last we have the then and now certificates. We had two 
One was for uh, tuition and one was for our sub-nursing services for our isolation rooms. With that, I'd like to ask the board to approve the fiscal consent items as listed. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Are there any questions or comments? Vote. And your consent item passed five to zero. Thanks, Amy. And now we're into superintendent update. Yes, I have three things I'd like to talk to you quickly about. One is round one of the vaccinations, as you know, are complete. So round two is Wednesday, March 10th. Um, it will start as we are mandated to do by when Mercy tells us we can. So the time schedule will be the same, 12 to five, go through a thousand vaccinations again. Um, very appreciative of how well it ran last time with Daryl and Kiva's help um, and setting all that up. The side effects of the second shot though are a little more um, <coughs> adverse than the reactions of the first one. So uh, we will be communicating to our parents what we will do with uh, Thursday, March 11th, as it looks like the day after the second shot, um, we will not be having in-person learning that day. That Friday is an in-service day, so there is no school for our students already. Uh, but we are very appreciative that our staff is seen as essential and we're receiving the shots. Uh, but we do know from um, talking to Dr. Fagan and Greg Testerman every Friday that the uh, round two shots have a much different effect on folks than first round. So um, communication will be coming out. Secondly, House Bill 67 has been introduced, um, and this is very important, I believe, for um, all those schools that are getting vaccinations and returning to in-person learning and for our students. And it is a request to waive all state testing for the 2020-21 school year. It exempts schools from administering the state assessments. It also requires the Department of Education to seek a waiver from the U.S. Secretary of Education from federal testing requirements for this year. It also grants graduation flexibility and extends remote learning flexibility into next school year. So that is uh, a big house bill that they are um, moving through very quickly and they have to move it through quickly if they're going to do anything because we have testing in Ohio starting March 22nd. Uh, the reason behind pushing it through is you have uh, learners who have been in person all year, 50%, 50% that have been in remote learning. So there will be no consistency in any scores that come out. Um, so we would like to be able to spend the fourth quarter teaching our kids and make, doing the makeup learning that the governor has requested. And if you have to waste a month and a half on that uh, testing procedure that has to go through with all the kids not receiving equal access to an education statewide, then how do you use the uh, results of the testing to do anything? So that's being pushed through by the House and the Senate. Um, our schools um, have had many conversations um, with us and between themselves and they are looking at all options for end of the year recognition ceremonies of in-person. Um, just today, the governor talked about April 1, expanding the in-person um, events for sports, going from 15% capacity to 30%. So he announced that at his news conference today. So where before it was 15% capacity, it is now 30%. So we look uh, for that to expand our graduation seating to go up to 30%, which is great news. Um, we have performing arts starting to put out performance dates. Um, proms at both high schools, um, senior classes organizing their events, um, what's going on there. Graduation will occur outdoor at both high schools um, with also the choice of a personal inside um, auditorium graduation um, where they can invite up to eight family members and now possibly ten um, with the change of venue so it depends on what the mass gathering order becomes. And then the state and Hamilton County orders and guidelines will be followed until they are changed and we'll do our best to make the close of the school year as normal as possible. But it seems like things are changing. Um, we are expected to go to Orange and Hamilton County according to Mr. Kesterman um, because he says it's uh, slowing the spread down. Uh, people are doing a great job wearing masks. 12% uh, of Hamilton County is now vaccinated which is a little behind the rest of the state because we are so big. Uh, but they think they can do some catch up. They were slowed down last week because they couldn't get the vaccinations out with the weather that was out, but they think they will catch up. Uh, the other good news is they're now um, working on a vaccination for kids ages six to 17, which was not in the works before. 
and they're hoping by next September that it might be a possibility for kids. So that's good news also. Um, Johnson & Johnson now has a vaccination that could come out with mid-March, which is only one shot, so that's more good news. So the more that comes along, the better off we are. Um, but we are just excited to get the vaccinations and start having some end-of-the-year activities, get back to some normalcy, being able to expand how many can attend our ceremonies as we end the year. All our schools are putting out dates. I know show cards have already had events like we talked about, and then other functions are starting to come out also with end-of-the-year ceremonies for our seniors, signing events, top 10 events, um, and then graduation being the most exciting thing. So as soon as we finalize some dates, and I just wanted to make sure that our listening public is aware, we have been in constant communication with Millette Hall. They have advised us to go find another venue because they do not see us being able to use their facilities for our graduation. So we're looking at um, outdoor graduations inside the district at our football stadium. So, um, and that's all I have. You know, that's not always a bad thing, Kevin, one, because when I graduated in 1978, our graduation was on the football field at Coleraine High School. And we'll have a date pick, and we'll have the next day as a rain date, so we'll be ready to go if Mother Nature doesn't agree with us. <laughs> I was nine when you graduated. Yes, you know, <laughs> that, that, that hurts. That, that really hurts. Oh, I appreciate that. Love you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Board member comments. Joe? I just want to make two comments. First of all, for a guy like me to flunk playing the triangle and blocks in elementary school, <laughs> I'm very impressed with the motivation of the music teachers in the district. I wish them all the luck in their recruitment of students because the music department is really kind of a unique situation. The second thing is I want to commend the administration on the vaccine distribution in early February. It was a well-orchestrated procedure and the personnel who received it, uh, or the personnel who received the vaccine. My only negative comment is I didn't get a lollipop after the shot. I better get one this time. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Jim? Um, yeah, just like what Joe said about the uh, performing <laughs> the performing arts. Yeah, they do they do a great job, and they always have. And uh, hopefully, they can get back on track and get more kids and involved because it's very important. And then the presentation on the Houston Early Learning Center. Those guys do a great job over there. And, um, you know, they are five star award, and you can't get any higher in the state of Ohio than that. So. We're doing, they're doing an excellent job um, with that with our kids and, and that stat that they gave that when those kids come out of there, there's 86% of them are ready in the state, you know, based on what the state says, they're ready to go into kindergarten. It's, it's just unbelievable um, what, what a good job they do. Yeah, just uh, uh, like to thank for, thank Thanks for the uh, presentation from the music department this evening, and also a uh, Houston Early Learning Center. Uh, all four of my boys have taken part in the preschool program here at Northwest Local, uh, both at Houston Early, Early Learning Center, and also when the preschool program was at Taylor. So uh, the uh, preschool program through Northwest Local School District is uh, top notch. That's all I have. Okay. Um, I thought we had great presentations the dialogue with um, the music teachers was phenomenal. We need to do more of that. That was great. Um, totally agree. It's always hard when one of the last ones to speak, but music is so important. Fine arts is so important for these kids. And it kind of breaks my heart that they've taken such a hit of the numbers. Um, and it's because of this lovely pandemic that I really feel confident that um, through a lot of work and teamwork, we'll be able to get those numbers back up um, and look forward to be able to attend um, the programming that all of you put on. Um, I, I would um, challenge anyone to drive around in our area every preschool.
people have to have a banner out that shows what stars they are. And you, it, there's not too many that you see a five. So trust me when I say, I mean, I, you see ones and twos and threes, um, maybe a four here and there. But for the Northwest District consistently to have a five-star preschool um, right in your own backyard, I just want to encourage everyone to take advantage of it because these kids, they get them prepared and ready to start the gym set kindergarten. So congratulate that whole entire staff. I mean, we work together very well. And I think it was a great presentation to, to show just, just a small tidbit of what they do on a daily basis with all the kids. Um, I was also very happy to hear that both high schools are going to have prom. Um, I know it's tough times, but um, I'm glad that that's being able to go. It might not be exactly like prom score a few years ago, but just the fact and the opportunity that these kids get to have it, I think is very important. So very happy to hear that. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned with Colette so that when people um, start talking about graduation, they understand that wasn't a choice of ours. When we were told that we can't go to Millette Hall. So, I, I, I think it could be done and be done nicely at um, um, the high school on the football field and um, to look forward to that as well. Good. Thanks, Dave. Um, I think everybody's just about said everything. I want to do want to thank the music program. Um, thank you uh, to those that I've met and that have influenced my, my children. Um, I can't repay you for that. Um, same with Aaron McGee, who's retiring. Um, the influence on my two kids has been immense from, from that one individual. And, and I wish her the best uh, as she uh, takes on new endeavors. Um, I love that, uh, Todd, I like your comments when we were talking about the band about, let's look at this stuff, let's be out of the box. Um, just because we've done things a certain way for uh, a period of time, uh, I think this pandemic has certainly taught us that we have to kind of relook at things. And, and so I, I throw that challenge out to our, our music program to come up with ideas to engage because I, this, this is a program, fine arts is a program that they need to start going with. Um, and, and truly they do carry it through their entire life. Um, other than that, I, I love to see that our numbers are going down with COVID. Uh, I'm glad everybody is uh, vaccinated and I wish everybody the, the best second round. And I'm sure Daryl will have lollipops ready for everybody this time. <laughs> uh, and with that, uh, we will move into uh, adjourn the meeting. Do I have a motion and a second? Second. Motion and a second. Everybody's in agreement. We will adjourn the meeting. And that passes five to zero. Thank you for joining us for the meeting, and we will see you the next Board of Education meeting.